and beginning with the well-known opening. O oh God, come to our assistance. O oh Lord, make haste to help us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Thought I printed off Mary's reading, so forgive me while I just find it from my. The reading. Joan Chittister tells us that when Benedict saw the soul of his friend, Abbot Germanus, taken into heaven, he was astounded by the sight and unsure of his own perception. So he called upon Severanus for confirmation. Benedict had developed sight and insight. Benedict had begun to see things differently, but the very time that Benedict, as unique, precious, precious all-absorbing. People cease to be numbers and stereotypes. They become individuals to us, every one of us is on their way to God. Heavenly Father, open our hearts to the silent presence of the spirit of your son. Lead us into that mysterious silence where your love is revealed to all who call. Maranatha, come, Lord Jesus.
So those of you that received um, the tiny little one sentence, one sentence autobiography of Mary Mayer was so typical of Mary. Um, Mary is an extremely hardworking member of our community. She connects everywhere across the world and beyond our own community. And she reaches out and offers in so many ways. And yet she says so little about herself. And if you want to have a sense of how much Mary does reach out, um, she wrote two articles in the Oblate newsletter, the VA Vitae, um, both about the work that is taking place across Latin America. Mary is um, our national Oblate coordinator in Paraguay, but is very involved in the wider Latin American community Recently, uh, a website being set up to support each other across that part of the world, and also involved in the Latin American Oblate Retreat. So if you want to know a little more about Mary, then those two articles give a sense of the reaching out that she offers constantly. We became friends when we were involved in the uh, incredible challenge of the international oblate retreat it was an enormous undertaking and Mary was tireless in the work that she uh, she did during that time and during her own really debilitating bout of uh, Covid. So whilst she's not here with us in person. She will be listening to this, I hope, on YouTube afterwards. And her, uh, her offering to us today is, is by video. And she's called her title, Be Prepared and to Be Challenged, which I think is very Benedictine. So I think Mary is going to share the screen and share Mary's talk with us today. And Mary, you're on mute, so I'm guessing we might not hear it. As you know, it's a little early on our side of the world, so it's a pleasure to be to share with you in any case. Um, when I thought about what I could possibly share with you, I really doubted um, that I had anything that could be of value. And then at the same time, I realized that this year has been incredibly rich for me. Um, it's been a... I don't, a year of constantly trying to balance everything, balance prayer and work, study and learning, and silent listening and gentle sharing, and how despite all my best intentions and to keep it a very quiet, calm year, um, it's been a bit hectic, uh, one of a lot of work, um, but even more a year of reflection, of introspection, and of really deep soul searching. So, um, as I was looking at the Old Lake Guide, there's a, a line that I wanted to share. And it says, as mentors to other Old Lakes, we're expected to guide, gently challenge, and be prepared to be challenged as part of our own oblate path. And I think that that's probably 
that's probably what's been happening. Um, just being prepared, perhaps I wasn't as prepared as I had thought. So I thought maybe what I could do is just share some of the the lessons that I've picked up on this year and that I could say I'm learning and have learned or still learning. Um, nothing will be um, earth shattering or completely novel. I'm sure that many of you have already been through, through these things yourselves. Um, but uh, perhaps yeah, it'll resonate or echo in your in your hearts as well. So the first the first thing I wanted to focus on is each person's path is different. Kind of obvious, <laughs> but uh, I found that that the responsibility of informing people and guiding others as they seek. You know whether they want to begin meditating or whether they want to ponder um where as to beginning the oblate path or getting on the oblate path um it's been a really rich challenging and humbling experience for me um listening to others asking questions that i would have never asked myself or ask anybody else it reminded me of when i first decided to open a, a meditation group and uh, a fellow meditator advised me she she was very open about it she advised me she said i think that you should you know i think you should um uh, prepare to answer certain questions and i asked well what kind of questions i i knew the answers i thought i knew the answers <laughs> And she said, well, they might want to ask you why you have to stop thinking. Why do you have to leave your thoughts behind? And I remember listening to her and thinking, why in the world would anybody be so silly as to ask why would we leave our thoughts behind? Because for me, discovering um, the relief, because it was a relief of being able to leave thoughts behind, all my busy thinking behind had been life altering. It was what, it was the reason I, 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 I stayed, I, I, I continued meditating. So of course I didn't really pay much attention to what my friend had said. And uh, I didn't really prepare myself for that question. And of course on the first day of, of the group, the first question, the very first question was, why do we have to leave our thoughts behind? And why, you know, why do we have to leave our images behind? And why can't we say our prayers aloud? And uh, thinking makes us human. That was basically the thing. And then the second question that they asked me that I had never imagined anyone would ask me either is, is it dangerous to leave our minds without any thought? Um, open to, and it was always like open to and nothing came afterwards. I wasn't sure what we were opening ourselves up to. And listening to seekers of all ages, pondering, you know, issues and asking questions that I never would have imagined has really forced me to listen more carefully, more closely, um, more deeply to what might be behind the question. Um, I guess I became aware that behind the question there was a, an idea or a thought and, and, and an emotion, a feeling. So if we think about the first question, <laughs> the one about thinking, <laughs> why, why do we have to stop thinking? Um, I guess I realized that the idea is that uh, thinking is who we are, you know, and, and it might come to us from Jaskardi's time. Um, I think, therefore, I am. And if you believe that the thinking is who I am, then of course, if I stop thinking, I cease to be, right? So. From there, you can imagine that it would be easy to be afraid to stop thinking, to, to go into silence. And the second question that, that came up 
about, you know, isn't it dangerous to leave our minds our, a blank slate there, thinking that something was going to come out. I think also is based on the idea that, and maybe even based on verses that we find in the Bible, that that there's evil within us, right? That the evil resides within us. So, so perhaps the fear that when I when I stop um, thinking, when I leave my mind open, it's open to evil. Right? And so, of course, that they would fear going into the deep, going in, within their hearts. Um, I always think of Father Joe Pereira that he always reminds us that all we're going to find in our hearts is acceptance and love. But I don't think that's something I can tell them. Or I could, but, you know, they've already been told that. So one of the things that I've learned is that I don't have the right. I don't have the need. And I don't have the responsibility to try to psycho whatever, analyze them or or coach them or or give them any type of therapy. Um, I don't even have to teach them because they don't need me to teach them what's right or wrong. They don't need me to tell them what they should do or what they should think because that's what people have been telling them their whole lives. And I think that what I've learned is that my task or my role, and I think the role of most of us that, that are with other other people who are interested in, in meditating or interested in, in uh, coming onto the path is just to listen and, and, and to provide a very, to provide time on one hand and to provide a very safe, gentle space in which uh, the person can unravel um, his or her own thoughts and feelings as they connect with God. And it sounds logical. I mean, when I say it like this, it sounds quite logical. But realizing this and really realizing it has not been easy for me um, as a teacher. Um, I always respected the way learners perceived information, the way they processed it, and the way they produced it and returned it to us and could explain it to us. But the content itself was mine. Um, I had the truth. I was the teacher. I had the truth. <laughs> I knew the grammar rules. I knew the vocabulary. I knew the structure. And this is what I, I gave them, right? And on our path, this isn't the case. That, I have nothing, I got, there's nothing I can give them. Um, and I think that, that that has been so humbling and, and, and such a big lesson for me to, to realize that all I can do is um, gently and respectfully accompany the person on their own path. Um, I guess this has also helped me to look more carefully at my own questions and my own doubts in a in a very humble way, but in a very I, I think in a more realistic manner. Um, I realize I may have questions that other people don't have, and and what has come out of this year. I, for me this year especially, is that each one of us is so, so preciously unique, so incredibly unique. And the plan that the Lord has for each one of us is a very personal plan. And the path is different. We will never be the same path. The other, or another, challenge for this one. I think I could make a long list, but I'm going to share three, um, is in God's time. And this is something I say every day. You know, it, it's good, all will work out, all will be well in God's time. 
And I remind myself constantly of this. It's not in my time. It's in his time. It's God's time. But as I come upon people, you know, we find speaker, uh, seekers, and then we think, wow, this person could be, you know, would, would really do well in meditation, or this person would be really should think about the old way path. And I can't help wanting to say something or wanting to um, nudge them a little bit. And sometimes I'll ask straight out, you know, did, have you thought about it or would you be interested in it? And some of them look at me as if I'm proposing something completely insane for them. And others will, will answer something like, well, yes, I, I think that is my path, but not yet. I want to, whatever, finish school or want my kids to grow up or you know, when I retire or there's always these. And, and I guess that's, that's the hard part for me. It's God's time, not my time beginning. And I think I'm only beginning to accept that, that, that I have to step back and I have to respect the time frame, God's time frame. And, and I've come to understand that that's really the only time frame that works. That when I try to interfere with God's time frame, I kind of mess things up. It doesn't always work out. So I think in God's time is one of the, the lessons that that's, that's becoming more and more clear for me. And the third challenge is striking a balance. I, it's a topic that seems to take front seat at some times, and then it goes back into the back seat. And it, it comes up once and again in my on my path. And that's how to strike a balance. How do I strike a balance walking the tightrope? I, mean, really, I really feel like it's a tightrope of being ecumenical in an extremely religious environment, while at the same time being considered too Catholic um, by others, by, by a more secular group. This year, or yeah, I think this year, the end of the last probably, watching Father Lawrence uh, share views with the Dalai Lama, and then watching um, Professor Darwin uh, share uh, his vision on Sufism. That was for me, it was wonderful. And then just simply watching Giovanni, you know, sharing with us um, his gentle yoga practice um, from Lombo. I mean, these are, these are things that fill me with joy. They fill me with, I don't know, peace. And more than that, just this, this, this feeling that I can trust that, that we really are one, that we don't, that we're not divided. But then, on the other hand, I'm confronted by some who question the fact that the community uses the word mantra. I mean, mantra is already the reason they, they don't want to consider it. And then others who feel that perhaps the, the prayers are a little too Catholic. So I find myself feeling that I'm caught, what is the, the, the saying, between a rock and a hard place, um, unable to, to find that perfect equilibrium in which I can be who I am and yet be open to others. And I was, I was discussing um, this with several people. It's an ongoing discussion because it's something I think we share in, in, in many communities, not only in, in, in our country. And I, I was discussing this with Francisco, who is a novice in, in Spain, and who, like me, was attracted to the, the WCCM because of the openness, of this frank openness to the other traditions. And without any intention or desire to convert others, but rather just to welcome um, others in a hospitable Benedictine manner. And I'd like to share with you what, what he wrote. He, he responded um, to me last week. And he wrote, I believe that the reason we, the WCCM, can occupy a privileged place in the ecumenical dialogue is the fact that more than a doctrine, a religion, or a belief system, 
the foundation from which everything else flows is the fruit of a universal practice, the experience. And this fact allows us to enter into harmony with other traditions without getting caught up in a senseless intent to combine different traditions. And he ended saying that reality is infinite and that it can't be narrowed down simply by different points of view. And that as the finite beings that we are, we can only start from a specific point of departure. And that point of departure for us will always be our common Christian roots. I don't know, for me, it was, it was wonderful what he, what he said to me. And, and it was very soothing for my soul at that moment. That was a bit worried. Um, all in all, definitely had to, to deal with the challenge. But I think that walking, as we all do in our community, walking together this path that we walk together with others, sharing with others, whether old lady or novice or possibly whether we're just a seeker, has allowed me to better appreciate how the Holy Spirit works so differently and so personally and so perfectly in each person's life. And and, and as I walk with, with them, I can see the, the presence of the spirit in their lives. And it's such an incredible experience that it constantly strengthens my faith. And I guess what it does is just allows me to continue to be prepared to be challenged as, as I walk through on this path. So that's what I wanted to share today. I hope it's a some value to to you and thank you for listening and god bless well first of all i should say that some of you um, may have found that a difficult one to listen to because of the sound and our apologies but there's something about the presence of us together that allows us to actually be present to those things that may be difficult to hear and Mary gave us three bullet points under her title, Be Prepared and Be Challenged. Each person's path is different. In God's time, in striking a balance. And it was wonderful to catch the words that resonated with us as we listened, or as we read those words continuously through her talk. And interesting that I had read Mary's articles, little articles in the VA Vita. And just at the end of her talk, she was talking about striking the balance between the ecumenical, between the reaching out to the sister traditions that, that Lawrence frequently does. And this is a, a paragraph from her description of the new Latin American way of working together. And she describes an event that they had. And she said, there was no competition, no selfishness, nor ego in our team. It was clear from day one that together we achieved more. Together we listened and learned more. Together, we grew stronger, and together we could give more. And furthermore, we found that working together was much more enjoyable. Now, I just feel that that 
summed up very much of what Mary was offering us today in her talk. So thank you, Mary. Wonderful to hear you and to see those wise words that you offered in summary. So uh, Julia will tell us next about next week's talk, um, but in the meantime, let us just sit quietly and say together, may the divine assistance be always with us and with our absent brothers and sisters. Amen. Thank you to Mary for sharing that and for Julia and Alan in the background as always. Thank you, Janet, uh, and thank you to Mary. And next week, we have Beate Stella talking to us, and the title of her talk is Mindfulness Met Meditation is resident in Residential Aged Care, Spiritual Wisdom from the Frail Aged. And about Beate, she um, has been a meditator for many decades, always humbled by going back to a beginner's mind. In her early 20s, she went to India and had a life-changing experience living in Shantivanam Ashram and drinking in the wisdom of Father Bede Griffiths and volunteering with Mother Teresa's sister in Kolkata. This is where the seed of meditation was sown in her heart. Professionally, she is a Sydney-based adult educator, published author, accredited mental health social worker, counsellor, clinical supervisor, spiritual well-being coordinator, and a registered nurse. A few years ago, she did her master's research on mindfulness meditation groups in residential aged care. In April, 2022, Beate's research was published as Mindfulness Meditation in Residential Aged Care, what frail older people identified as beneficial from their spiritual care and well-being. And that was from the Journal of Religion, <clears throat> excuse me, Spirituality and Spirituality and Aging. I think that sounds uh, a really interesting talk. And I'm sure we'll all uh, look forward to hearing her next week. So in the meantime, many thanks for being with us today. I hope you have a very good week and uh, God bless and see you all again very soon.